Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Owen Wells. I'm a senior lecturer in BA Graphic and Media Design um, here at London College of Communication. Um, just quickly before we start, uh, I need to let you know that this event is being recorded and will be made public on LCC's YouTube channel afterwards. And by attending a live event, guests agree to any contributions being captured and used for this purpose. So welcome everyone to the Peter Kennings Memorial Award for 2021. Peter Kennings was a pioneering digital design lecturer at London College of Communication from the mid 1980s until he sadly passed away in 2012. The Memorial Award was set up in recognition of his achievements at the college and to celebrate final year undergrad student work from across the design school, which demonstrates innovation in digital design and digital media. <clears throat> um, it's been my pleasure to help organize the award this year. And now I never met Peter. Um, sadly, he passed away before I joined LCC, but I think it's pretty special that uh, we can come together in his name and celebrate the achievements of our student cohort. We had so many excellent submissions this year, and I think it's a real testament to our student body and the environment here at LCC that we have so many students using digital design and digital media to interrogate areas of practice, which not only resonate with them personally, but I think also make significant contributions to knowledge and discourse in wider society. Uh, let me quickly give you the running order for today. So in a moment, I'll pass you over to Graham DeProse to talk a little more about Peter and the prize. And then I'll introduce the eight shortlisted students of which you can see um, them here on the screen and invite them to present their projects that they submitted. And finally, I'll pass over to Graham for the difficult bit of announcing the winner. But for now, Graham, it's, it's over to you. And you're muted, Graham. Right, start again. Good afternoon. Right. Okay, I'm just trying not to sneeze or cough. Um, <clears throat> my name is Graham Diprose. I was a colleague of Peter's for many years from 1984 until I retired from London College of Communication in 2011. Um, I was really working down in the design photography area uh, through my career and Peter was working in the digital design area. Both of us were very lucky in that through the 1990s and beyond into the beginning of the, 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 this century, we were absolutely at the cusp of the digital revolution. Um, I was able to go to some major companies and who had 17,000 pound camera backs and say, please, can I have two? My Dean has a thousand pounds for each and I'd walk away with them. Peter, on the other hand, was able to really get into some very complex programs very early on. We were doing insane things. Um, if you ever happen to know that one of the predecessors of the Apple Mac was a computer called an Apple IIe, uh, we're really going back in history now, we were running a bank of 12 carousel projectors driven by an Apple IIe computer running live tape pulses to make it all go and change the slides. Um, Peter ran a program called Drector, which I hope none of you have ever heard of. If you do, avoid. But Drector was the very first program which was interactive in any way at all. And we were amazed. We would find that if, he, if you pressed one button, the program would go off and do one thing. And if you pressed another button, it would do something else. Now, thinking of you lot with your phones and your internet and all the rest of it and all your web pages, that sounds crazy, but this was really serious revolutionary stuff. And in the very early days of the internet, it was Peter who was finding out the best way to navigate and the best way to compute things. So all of you in the school who are now working with interactive design in any way, shape or form, then Peter was the pioneer of the whole way, pro way the process started. I recall one day having, I used to run the, the video editing suite, which involved huge, great Sony tapes. And one day we found a program and got it downloaded because we went to a show and there was Adobe. And it was called Premiere. 
So we had a go on Premiere, Peter and I, and actually tried and make Premiere work. And so it went up, but we were, we were able to mess about with all these programs right at the start of them. And it was a very exciting time all round for everybody, including the students. Uh, but uh, we did fly by the seat of our pants a few times when it came to private views and you press a button and either it works or it doesn't work. But uh, uh, I think, well, I won't say you get it easier these days, but, uh, but there we go. After I retired in 2011, um, I went to work for a uh, independent photography school in, in England and helped them set up a master's course and wrote a textbook of photography, which is in the school library. It's called Photography, the New Basics. If you like photography, do have a look. It's not really in a commercial outbreak. I don't make that much money on it, honest. But um, we, I then became chair of an organization called EVA London, Electronic Visualization in the Arts. And this is a com conference run by the British Computer Society and the Computer Arts Society of Great Britain that's been going since 1990. And we actually had our, uh, we had our uh, conference last week with over 70 academics from all over the world presenting. So we'd have someone in Melbourne first thing in the morning and they were sort of last thing at night and just having their cup of cocoa. And then some six, six hours later would have somebody in Vancouver who was just waking up bleary eyed and doing their, their presentation with their first cup of coffee of the day in their hand. So very exciting stuff. And uh, we will be running the conference every year. One of the things we run as part of the conference is called a research workshop. And the research workshop is a chance for undergraduates who've just left and students going on to do postgraduate work and students who might be going on later to do PhDs or even just go in out into the great big outside world to bring their work to EVA and to have it published for free and to do a presentation to this conference of academics all over the world for free which is why I said to you lot, you might like to have my email afterwards. Uh, so this is the sort of thing which I've been involved in. I'll say a little bit about the judges who actually have, 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 have done this um, uh, award for us very kindly. Um, through my lovely contacts with Eva London, I'm very privileged that I work with some amazing people. So the chair of our panel, is Dr. Nick Lambert, who is the chair of the Computer Arts Society and also head of research at Ravensbourne University. Uh, second judge is uh, Carla Rappaport, who is the founder of the very prestigious Lumen Prize for Digital Art. And the third judge is Afra Shemza, who is one of the founders of the Flux community. Now, if you don't know anything about the Flux community, it is an amazingly supportive group of a couple of thousand, mainly London-based artists, designers, performers, musicians. And we are on socials regularly, we support each other, we collaborate on things. And it's a real mixture of folks like you and next to them will be sitting some uh, academic uh, from, from who's, who's dropped into London from abroad. Uh, all sorts of interesting talks and speakers. So I, it's free. Join the Flux outfit, uh, pretty please. And while we're, that, while we're at that, the Lumen Prize, if you do go on to do a master's anywhere, has a student section and we're always looking for lovely, lovely projects like all of yours to be part of the Lumen Prize. I'm going to round off by actually just saying a little bit more about that. The three judges, Nick, Afra and Carla, have all said to me that they have been amazed by the outstanding quality of what you guys and girls have been able to produce through a very, what must have been a very difficult 18 months since this pandemic began. The standard of concept, the standard of delivery, uh, the standard of output has been higher, I think, than we've ever had before here. So I'd like to congratulate all of you right at the start for what you've been able to achieve. It's super. Uh, and whoever wins today, please stay in touch with me and we'll try and do some nice things for all of you if we possibly can and if you'd like that. Okay, that's all I really have to say. Have fun, enjoy presenting to us 
and, uh, and everybody else. Great stuff, Graham. Thank you. Um, so as I said, the award is open to students across the design school. And this year we have eight shortlisted students. So from BA user experience design, we have Christine, Gabe and Carol. Um, actually, that's not that's information experience design. That's my fault. Sorry about that. From BA design for our direction, we have Daniela and Rebecca. And then from graphic and media design, we have Deanne, Eliza and Homan. So um, I'd like to invite the students now to present their projects. We've got a running order. I think people, people know who's going first. So over to the shortlisted students. Hi, yeah, sorry. Uh, give me one sec to share my screen. Okay, everyone can see that? Cool. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Christine. I'm a recent graduate of information interface design. And today I'll be talking to you about my final major project called Lost and Found. So Lost and Found was mainly a cultural examination aimed at exploring the immigrant and diasporic community with specific focus on second generation and multi-generational immigrant individuals. And what I really wanted to do with this project was find new ways to acknowledge and celebrate this cultural group that is quite complex ever-changing and expansive. And I did this through an ethnographic lens by exploring and collecting different stories, relating them back to objects and art, um, artifacts, and then attempting to build some sort of archive or museum for the specific cultural group. So this project was defined by three major goals. The first, to create an archive or history of the transcultural identity. Two, to, to create a practice in representing its more multifarious condition and three, to, to create a sense of curiosity, collectiveness, and naturalization around telling diaspora stories. So I began this um, project with an inquiry that was really about exploring this idea of the transcultural. And it was a three-step process that began with defining the multi-generational immigrant experience and ended with reframing it. And when I came to defining it, I was um, able to determine that the condition was one that was fraught with a lot of tension, and this is mainly due to the fact that it's often defined by its proximity to fully formed historical identities, rather than it being able to exist as its own thing. So when it became to reframing the experience, it was about recharacterizing how we can perceive it from inside the community as, as, as well as outside it. And so I chose to reframe the multi-generational immigrant experience as a trans condition, also known as transcultural or transnational. And as a way to kind of acknowledge and monumentalize it as a, as a revolutionary condition and as a rejection of colonialist binary attitudes. Um, so going forth with this, the project was um, really about designing an experience that explores the representation of this identity and also the sharing of it. And so the first part was about reinventing the monument and it was driven by a co-design process with six multi-generational immigrant participants and included an interview into interactive activities. And so when it came to reinventing the monument, I really wanted to create um, more of an evolved form of celebration that sat outside the official designation of white colonial heritage and restrictive permanency. And it was really a balancing act between celebrating the individual's unique makeup as well as the wider community's similarities and experience and object. And so when I was designing this, these monuments, it was about represent, less about representing the individual's likeness and more about representing a shared history. And I drew from the practice of the totem, which is a monument that is created through an arrangement of symbolic objects. And so as the co-design process began, I asked each of the participants to bring in five to six artifacts. And this kind of began the ethnographic examination as each participant was kind of asked to represent the identity through a series of objects. And as I began to collect all these different objects, it quickly started to grow into this beautiful archive or museum of this specific cultural group. And so this is an example of one of the um, co-design processes. This is one participant, he's British Caribbean, but born in London, but raised in Italy. And these are his four artifacts. And this was a generative um, kind of activity that we went through. And then finally together, we were able to design this monument that acts as a representation of his multiple um, cultural identities. And this is five other um, 
monuments that were created with the same process with different participants. So the second part of the process was about, uh, of the project was about encountering the monument. And this was um, a consideration into how the wider community can experience these monuments. And I chose an augmented reality experience for this um, specific interaction. And mainly it's because I love the idea of connecting stories and artifacts to location and creating a sense of community through space. So the idea of an audience encountering these monuments within their own neighborhoods on their way to work, it was like really creating this sense of community and solidarity within the city of London. So here are just some images of it. And then the third part was about building this um, collective history. And I was thinking about how the whole experience could be situated within, within an app. And this was really an encouragement for the notion of collection, which is to create and build an archive or museum during the audience's journey of exploring and, and encountering these monuments. Um, so this is the app. And then this project is an ongoing process that will only grow with more monuments and as more stories are being told. And it's a slow gathering and an acknowledgement of this unique and revolutionary cultural group. And it's a way for us to begin to create space for the multi-generational immigrant community within a city like London. Thank you. And that's it. Um, that's, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so it's my turn now. Um, I just want to say as well, Christine, I really love your project and would love to somehow collaborate because mine's really similar. Um, so my name is Danny. I am a, I've just graduated off design for art direction and my project um, of my FMP is titled Majority World Diasporas and under that I pitched a lecture series, a diaspora dictionary trading card set and some rugs. Um, and at the bottom there I've written accessibility breeds innovation because a lot of my project was kind of using like open source um, technologies, digital media, social media to connect with diasporas and their stories and stuff. Um, so majority world is a term um, designed to replace terms such as ethnic minorities and less developed um, countries. And with this project, I kind of aim to rewrite culture and like kind of reclaim narratives about like our diaspora histories and stories and stuff. Um, and mostly did this through like digital media. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh. So I started off with like research into first my own heritage as a Nigerian immigrant. Um, I kind of came across online archives, university pages, all of this were like really um, integral for kind of finding out information about the majority world, but also how the stories are shared and what those stories are. So a lot of online learning, a lot of Wikipedia, and it was just kind of, it was with the times that we're in and everything, it was like um, good to be able to just use basic kind of medias and tools to just create something fun. So I came across a video by an artist called Nicholas Karodi about the situation in Israel and Palestine and Gaza Heights and stuff. And this, um, this inspired me to kind of create a mock event based off his video and based off my kind of thinking around um, decolonization and what I call like a spectacle of decolonization in my project and I actually reached out to him and he like was so happy to kind of do it and this actually spurred on the events part of the program so this kind of work is what Christina Sharp describes as wake work and she writes the work we do requires new modes and methods of research and teaching new ways of entering and leaving the archives of colonialism and I kind of took this quote to mean like using the tools that we have at hand but thinking through these big social questions and problems in new ways and finding new ways to present them. So here are some examples of some of the work I did on the left. 
I've got um, the Diaspora Dictionary call out, which I posted on my Instagram to um, get people to submit to a Google Drive ongoing list of terms of different um, majority world diasporas. And I illustrated these terms through um, like dictionary trading cards, which I also like animated with After Effects and Illustrator and stuff. And I kind of used um, the histories and information that I'd found out about different cultures to create the visual identity, as you can see on the right. And the video I'm going to play next is an example of this trading card that I used um, with like a term from the dictionary used in context. <laughs> <laughs> Look, my friend, if you are joking with me, you better stop it. I'm not your mate. So what is all this research good for if, like, there's no one there to kind of, like, digest it and stuff? So I was really lucky to be able to put on some of two of my events with the LCC grad show events as well. Uh, a friend of mine that I met through social media, who is Haitian, I was able to connect with them and get them to do this really cool event with me on colonization and um, the situation in Nigeria and Haiti and how that served as a microcosm for like this post-colonial situation we're in. And yeah, so that was a pretty successful, uh, successful event. We had a humble um, views of 40 people um, and then on the right is just some more kind of ways I shared the project like through a cargo site um, through these like experimentations with the trading cards and also rugs as well which I make um, kind of based off all these imagery and uh, with this presentation for like today I kind of just wanted to highlight that anyone can do this work and like you know, answering society's big questions or at least trying to. It's just about having the like drive to do it. Like we have the tools, all the tools I use like Zoom, Adobe, Instagram. Most of them are like free or subsidized and like open source. And yeah, so here are some just um, images from my main project, including the dictionary cards, the rugs, um, and yeah, just general things. <laughs> Thank you. Um. I really like the majority words and the lost and found. And let me show my screen. Hi, I'm Dian, and I'm, my major is graphic and media design. And this is my work, Detection. And I have a field interest in digital media design and also the information design, and likes to use different methods to analyze social issues, and is willing to consider design under the different culture and pre present them in the aesthetic way. And this project is comprised of three elements. First is the information visualization, and two is generated coding, three is website. And the detection is the exploration of the relationship between the privacy and public. And I want to use this work to clarify the uh, people of the lack of the privacy awareness. And have you noticed that the privacy leak are getting more and more serious? And for example, the photo privacy leak, address privacy leak, phone number privacy leak, and so on. And the strange thing is that the friends around me in China have a weak awareness of privacy. And most of the world's most severe city are located in China. And the most exaggerated things, you will not have thought that all the underground station in China has security checks. And unlike the street airports, people don't care much about it. And if there are few things, the passengers can show the uh, security inspector that there is no need to put the bed um, in the belt. And I went to the tube station from um, five 
p.m. to 6 p.m. from during two weeks and taking photographs about different passengers uh, luggage. And I chose a few uh, station depending on the different environment. And I think that the people I can meet might not be different. And uh, I saw the security x-ray that can show everything in the back and through it, you can see the personal belongings that no more that normally invisible. And so uh, this is, is one of my most uh, in, uh, exciting experience that I have become a warrior to watch, to pick someone, to pick the passenger's uh, package. And when I collected this package and I got their permission, if they allow me to take the picture and maybe upload on the um, mockup website, and passengers who are not allow me to record with the X. And I found that the type of place affect the perception of the privacy. You can see the people from the school area, they have, they have 48 people permit to me to take pictures. So they are um, more willing, uh, they are more lack of the privacy awareness. And, um, can I hide, hide this? Okay. And the culture space is the, they have um, list people to allow me to take the picture. So they are privacy. Oh. And so I, um, my method is to decontrast, deconstruction. And my, I want to uh, decontrast the luggage to from layer one to layer 10. And you can see the different item from easy visible to um, invisible. And my purpose is when people carefully judge what the item is in the luggage are, they have actually picked into the privacy of others. And this is some of my um, uh, information visualization I outcome. And the station which has fewer people who don't permit me to take pictures. So the weaker the awareness of the privacy protection are and the larger of the field of view and the easily for them can uh, for others can see the object from this hole. So the hole and all the gaps um, is um, relevant to the public to the privacy. And this is one of my coding um, coding mockup and I use if long press the, uh, the mouse and the view will be much open. And the next one, next slide is my website.com. And the detection is a shared archive published on the internet. Uh, people can browse the luggage from the passengers at five different underground stations in the order of the time. You can see the time and oh, what happened. And click to view the contents of the each box and see the item scanned by security um, inspection through the gaps and in order from the utmost layer to the inmost layer. Um, this is just a, a mockup. If I want to develop, I want to develop this project to use the mouse tracking. If the mouse is stopped to moving, the the same object in this box will appear like this. And this is the uh, workspace area, and then the culture space. The gap will be much larger. And. And, and this is view the, click the view detail. This is the information about this station. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so 
much that was so so interesting it's so good to be in such good company both christine dia and danny um yeah i think i was aware of your projects in in one way or another so that's that's really great okay so Okay, so my name is Eliza and I'm from the Graphic and Media Design course um, and I'm going to be talking about my project called Am I a Feminist Bot, which I actually did at the very start of the academic year. So I'm really going to try and do my best to represent this project to the best uh, of my memory. Um, okay, so about the project, um, the project was intended to assess the potential and challenges of machine learning tools to embody feminist practice and ethos through text and typography. So the project addresses the nature of bias, AI characters, personalities, as well as ethics and diversity regarding the data sets. Um, so the experiments also questioned the complexion and the appearance of feminism and measured its authenticity in automated context. So it kind of was this Venn diagram of sort of feminist social context, or maybe even techno feminist social context with this sort of new addre addressing this new technology, which is machine learning that's becoming more and more available to kind of creatives like us also. Um, so yeah, embedded in the format title, this project was as, uh, led as a means of discovering and asking questions, answering some of them and reserving the rest for rhetoric. Um, and despite this project concluding in an outcome where I displayed my findings, I think the process was the project itself. Um, and I think I really tried to make the most out of an academic setting where my creative practice could be driven by research, criticality, learning and iteration, um, instead of kind of coming up with this final product necessarily. Um, so Ultimately, uh, this was the final outcome. It was a sort of interactive website, um, which displayed both visual and text-based findings from my experiments. Um, and it ultimately had these six screens, which all had different information in them. And the way that it worked was that I had used, um, first, firstly, I had trained, um, visual generative adversarial networks to create um, type typography based on uh, fonts designed by women and other underrepresented genders. So the sort of typefaces, uh, I suppose you could call them that, um, here are kind of made using these. Ideally, it would be a sort of feminist data set. Um, and also the text that would be appearing underneath the prompt. Um, on each of these pages, you would have maybe 20 to 60 different uh, machine and continuations of these prompts. So um, the machine would try and finish these sentences in whatever way it saw as appropriate. Um, so yeah, one of them was, I am a feminist because, the other was uh, just because I'm a machine does not mean that I can't, um, I, for example, control the good and the bad. And I think also the goal of some, uh, the way that I phrased some of these was, um, to maybe in a way sort of get a sense of empathy for the machine, because I think we anthropomorphize um, sort of this invisible character that we imagine is, uh, you know, presenting these ideas to us. And, and, and in some weird ways, I think we could be more empathetic to something like a machine than whatever underrepresented group it's kind of trying to imitate. So whether that be women or non-binary people or trans or underrepresented ethnicities or backgrounds. Um, so this, I'm going to show you maybe a little video where you can see roughly how it works. So I inter interaction wise, I wanted to make as, as easy for as possible for anyone to understand how to use the website. So the only two things that you could do was scroll out, around with your mouse. Um, and the other thing that you could do was just click anywhere and it would show the next screen with uh, the following experiment. Um, and also in the background of these, you can sort of see these animations following um, the mouse and they were actually reused, but I would like to think of maybe as kind of failed or unsuccessful experiments, at least in the sense that they didn't kind of come out as, uh, you know, type forms or glyph forms um, as I intended them to. Um, so there was a sense of kind of reusing and readapting um, digital outcomes that maybe, I don't know, it, it potentially has a sort of metaphorically ecological sense and an awareness of the fact that I have used 
you know, lots of internet and ultimately um, energy to kind of produce these outcomes. Um, so I kind of really wanted to make sure that I used everything I made. Okay, so, and as I said previously, it was really majorly, um, sorry, I had a video here, just let me see if I can find, okay, here it is. Um, so as I said, it was majorly based on questions. So um, there were three different processes here. So one of them was preparing the data set. The second was sort of understanding this visual relationship between graphic design and feminism and this machinic interpretation or normalization of whatever the data set presented. And the final was like learning how I can sort of interactively interact with this sort of machine and how I can feed it different information so that whatever outcome it would be coming up with would be in some ways and ideally in some meaningful ways more feminist or more activist in some sense. So yeah, so does a data set based on fonts designed by women and underrepresented genders constitute a feminist data set? How can I guarantee that designers represented in the data set hold feminist values? Um, and how does it affect or represent society when certain data sets are unavailable or insufficient for use in any meaningful machine training? So like the first problem that I came across um, with was that when I actually wanted to train these things on fonts designed by women, I realized that um, you know, there's really not that many out there that are easily accessible. Or the metadata isn't as clearly available. Um, so yeah, and is gender expression present in typographic practice? What is a feminist font? What does feminism look like from a graphic design sense? What's the difference between femininity and feminism in a visual context? Um, how can a machine learning model be tuned towards feminist creative practice? Is reusing failed experiment outcomes a statement in any way? ecologically or metaphorically, are perfect and clean visual GAN outcomes anti-feminist? So is this sort of perfection that's like the standard, maybe a, a sort of byproduct of patriarchal society? And is it uh, attempting to match machine ability to human ability anti-techno-feminist? Um, and is it actually feminist at all for a machine learning to model in the text form to just regurgitate feminist content that it was fed? Or would it be more feminist if it would somehow be fed, you know, ideologically different things, but it would only be coming up with these sort of feminist texts. Um, and ultimately, how can underrepresented groups uh, relate to the condition of the machine in relation to society? So I think, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> cool, yeah. I'm loving everyone's projects. It's also cool. Um, okay. Uh, can you see me sharing? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Gabe. Uh, I've literally just graduated from Interface and blah, 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 IID or UXD. Um, same thing. Um, my project is called Model, and it's a 3D magazine that explores what it would be like to combine real interviews with real people um, adjacent to the modeling and art industry um, with their digitized selves. Um, so what could you kind of describe model as? Um, I'd say probably if you imagine a lifestyle art magazine that combines real people with their digital selves, that would be model. Um, it's sort of an explorative magazine that tries to see how you could use 3D to explore real issues um, as well as sort of help educate people on how to do certain things, um, which range from a variety of different participants and interviewees, um, such as my good friend, a school friend who's become a model for Next Management, um, a streamer from the US um, who wanted a virtual YouTuber uh, model, um, another UAL grad, Amida Antilio, who is a photography graduate, um, as well as a classmate, Matthew Richmond, who just wants to be digitized. Um, as well as the magazine uh, containing educational content to teach people what it's like to create my models, um, the process that I went through, and how exactly you could start making your own sort of stuff. Um, but I think the biggest part of this project wasn't so much the visual of the magazine, the models, but the process that it employed. 
So digitizing a person um, is a pretty intimate and fragile process that required a pretty specialized workflow um, inspired by the work of photographers and models and my own uh, experience in doing modeling for friends. Um, I created this sort of workflow that, that helps me create the models with my top participants. Um, it begins with the discussion, talking about what is it to be digitized? What's the ownership? For example, when a model is created, um, will you delete it afterwards? Will it be used improperly? How much of it do I actually own? Um, and these discussions really help the participants to understand what 3D is like and make it a lot less daunting. Um, then a mood board, which is probably the most fun part, where I ask participants to make Pinterest boards or discussions or simply send me pics from Instagram. Um, talking about the sort of style they want and discussions about capabilities. For example, this participant really liked the modeling of Harry Styles and Kurt Cobain, as well as the fashion. And so his model was framed off that sort of styling. Um, then the more section, which looks terrifying. But this is how you transfer someone's likeness to a model. Um, created out of just three passport photos. This process, um, which is done in tandem with a participant, um, basically transfers their face onto a 3D model for later things. Um, then the editing process, where the model is fully assembled. Um, this is one of the most intimate process where the participant has constant influence on how the process is working, such as choosing the different hair, skin, etc. Um, the sort of the potential is unlimited in this stage and sort of tuning, uh, rendering, so getting more details, so what sort of materials you want to use, um, sort of really trying to get my participants to try different things. Um, as one described, they described this stage as open source daydreaming because of how it let them explore different parts of themselves to the compilation, which is from interviews which are actually compiled from live sessions I've conducted with participants, um, either through text or in the case of one participant, a live session in which I made their model in front of them and so gathered these interview uh, criteria and created a spread. Um, so this is a sort of representation of the real people and their models. So this is Mika, an American gaming streamer, um, my friend Matt from class, um, my friend Amandine, the model, um, and my friend Amina, the photographer. So what's sort of next for my project? Um, I'm sort of experimenting with offering digitized services off the back of this process. So allowing people who are not entirely adjacent to the modeling or the art industry to explore what it would be like to have a virtual model or how to get into 3D, as well as a new issue of the magazine currently in production. So yeah, these are my contact details and thank you for listening. So you are, that's such a nice project. I'm really impressed. <laughs> uh, one second, yeah, how do I share my screen? Uh, hello guys, uh, I'm Holman and I'm a uh, can you guys hear me? Just to make sure. Yeah. Yes, cool. So yeah, I'm Holman and I'm a recent graduate from the graphic and media design course. And yeah, today I would like to share about my project officially engaged and I'll briefly go talk about my ideology, my process and my and the development. So So yeah, uh, this whole project is part of my SIP project. And it's basically the whole idea is originated by my recognition of like how graphic design is actually a very important medium to bridge the gap between technology and people. Uh, like for example, like from the icon design on the toaster to like the buttons and the layout design on the screens, that like we all rely on visual cues to like understand how machine operates it and how to put like some sort of technology into good practice. So yeah, um, 
in my in my final year, I decided to make good use of this opportunity to really explore the possibility of combining visual communication with unfamiliar technology together, and see if I can spark anything new. <laughs> so yeah, um, I find a very interesting device called the Toby Eye Tracker, as its name suggests. Um, it's this device you can attach to your computer and then through the camera built in, you can understand where exactly you are focusing on the screen. And since it's first debuted in 2013, it has been marketing the product as a device for streamers to visualize their gameplay better for the audience or for market researchers to understand their e-commerce website design or like the interior design of the supermarkets. Still, uh, it, has, it has quite a while since it first launched its first product, uh, but the, re the reason why uh, Toby, the brand, has yet been very proverbial among us is because um, due to the limit application, like beside from stream, streaming and like marketing research, like people just don't really find the need to put it in somewhere else. Uh, plus also the technology is still like under coke, it's not that reliable. But in view of uh, a lot of big tech, uh, tech giant like Facebook or Apple that they're developing their own VR headset or AR glasses with eye tracking built in. I am expecting this technology will get back into mainstream soon. And then, and then a lot of like commercial application or information design will emerge by then. So I decided to have a first glimpse of that as well. Uh, and just to, yeah, and try to see if I can bring something new before the wave happens. So all the research just narrowed down into one simple question. It's like, what if poses become interactive simply without gaze? So for the final submission, I make a video and then to demonstrate a series of poses that I designed in Adobe Suite and you pair with processing, which is the JavaScript library coding language. Uh, by extract, obtaining the API from the eye tracker, I can like play around with it and then uh, design a few different interactions and different visual effects with the code and the device. My final submission for, for this project is an infotainment system called Visually Engage. So through the use of this system, you can make like the act of reading, like turn, turning the action of reading from something passive to something interactive and unlocking new forms of interactions and communication or even like design. So yeah, uh, I would like to go, go a little bit like with the contents that are shown in the video and hope the video clearly demonstrate what it does. Uh, so yeah, uh, the four poster design is for a mock -up conference events about journal journalism. Uh, each poster has its own unique me message and, and the interactive elements it has is actually aligned to the message because I don't see the point of like putting something moving around if it's not relevant. So like for example, the one on the left, uh, is just to talk about how annoying it is to read a news article nowadays. So when you look at the poster, you've got some like pop up floating icons, just like floating around, following your gaze, try to block your view as you're reading it. And then the one on the right is like, it will just turn from color to monotone to resemble how uh, we, we turn up 
we just like see things so with our narrow mind and just neglecting the diversity and possibility. And then, yeah, and then another one is like the, the, the blue one is to talk about the uh, how there's a lot of unreliable resource uh, online nowadays and it's so challenging to like, have a better picture of the things happening around us. So for this one, our gaze, our fish, yeah, our gaze is, is like a spotlight. We have to like, see through the layers of gossip and rumors to like look, to see the message hidden underneath. And then the last but not least is the one is the one talking about like, how sometimes the more we read, the more passive we become. So your, our vision just turned into a market which just like do to vandalize the poster as you look at it and just make it really impossible to read it again not to mention like allowing artists to read it afterwards <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah unfortunately due to COVID mass measures mm -hmm. like, uh, the show has moved to online yeah. but uh, you know to emphasize this is an actual working prototype uh, I just set up. A, I just uh, uh, I set up. I just simulate to simulate uh, how it might look, how it looks like if we were to show put it into a physical show. So now here you can see like, how the screen, the poster, like change when there's someone looking at it or walking nearby. Same thing here. You can see like how the graphics like just transform when it's being left alone or being looked at it. So this is more like a hypothesis as the technology will become more sophisticated and more reliable. So this is more like a hypothesis of what is the process being like used. But this kind of interactive process can be put outside for for commercial use. And yes. So uh, this is pretty much of some a quick summary of my project, and I hope my idea the whole idea of this is basically to like make our mundane life a little bit more interesting and entertaining through the through combining through the merge of visual communication and technology uh, i hope you find it inspiring thank you uh, hi there uh congrats everyone on their uh projects uh, my name is Karol Tuka, and I'm going to be presenting uh, my final outcome. Uh, just want to confirm that everyone is seeing my slides and hearing me. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, my uh, final major project is called Nothing to Hide, and it's a short web based educational game about um, digital advertisements, uh, weaponized digital advertisements, and the name is based on one argument that came up during my initial interviews. Uh, one person claimed basically that they have nothing to hide from uh, online advertisers. Therefore, they have nothing against they, their data being collected. And it turns out it's a pretty popular notion. Uh, and the game aims at uh, showing how digital ads can become a political weapon and how they can use people's data against them. Uh, basically to uh, counter that argument and um, the player is uh, takes the role of a political manipulator that uh, is tasked with helping the conservative party of a fictional country to win the presidential election and to do that they will use several strategies of weaponizing digital advertisements uh, and exploiting the voters data the player will learn how digital ad campaigns provide new opportunities uh, for disinformation, for propaganda, for other forms of media manipulation, and how they are designed um, to use people's vulnerabilities and uh, use their data against them. Uh, throughout the, uh, sorry, <laughs> the game is divided into tasks um, based on a report by organization Data and Society. Uh, and the task reflects some of the strategies of weaponizing digital advertisements. They are mobilizing infrequent voters um, to turn out in an election and also destroying, dividing the opposition, so destroying the reputation of political opponents uh, by targeting their voters with exaggerated or fake uh, articles about the mm, opposition. 
And throughout the gameplay, the player is um, presented with profiles of fictional voters containing their um, personal data, such as uh, name, age, ethnicity, voting history, and uh, the categories that social media companies are using to segment their audience for purposes of ad delivery. And the, the profiles, well, they are designed so the player sees themselves in the profile and uh, realizes how they are put in the same situation in real life. Um, and some of the profiles also show personality insights. So basically, it reflects how ad companies are using behavioral science to not only to just gather our information, but also infer very personal details about us, such as our personality traits or even our sexual orientation. So not even the data that we don't give out can be used against us to deliver ads to us. And the player has to choose one of three ads um, that's under the profile. Uh, they have to choose the ad that's going to be most successful as evoking intense emotions in the fictional voter based on the data that has been presented and therefore will be most successful at manipulating their behavior and um, according to the task. And um, at the end of the game, the player has an opportunity to learn about how those mechanisms have been employed in real life and uh, sees examples of advertisements that have been targeted in real life at certain uh, audiences and mm, yeah <laughs> so basically the uh, those mechanisms have been used in real life by multiple organizations such as Cambridge Analytica Russian Internet Research Agency and most prominent political parties in US and the UK and um, the exact results of using those mechanisms those uh, and platforms are impossible to um, quantify, but basically data, uh, data of millions, tens of millions of voters have been um, misused in this process. And um, it also shows that the, our democratic process can be uh, undermined by the usage of those digital ad platforms. And well, we don't have enough legislation to fight it. Therefore, it's very important to spread awareness about this issue. And um, with this game, I aim to showcase the severity of the problem that um, mass surveillance and behavior prediction and manipulation practices have created through exposing the player to the operations of a fictional political uh, government, a fictional government that uses those ma uh, malicious strategies. I aim at inoculating the player against both data extraction and political propaganda online. So the player is basically more likely to spot those things in real life um, after playing the game. And therefore, um, well, it's, there is a um, layer of protection against those things uh, for the player after playing the game. And um, I also aim at the banking, uh, misleading um, marketing of uh, companies like Facebook or Google, which claim that they are trying to improve our um, online experience with personalized ads, when in fact, in fact, they are, uh, well, they are not showing the negative side of this um, issue, which is taking advantage of our vulnerabilities and um, using our data against us and basically making profit out of uh, our behavior. Um, and I think games like uh, nothing to hide are a very good and easy accessible way of learning about those things um yeah and here's the link to the game if anyone would like to try it and that's it thank you Hello. 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 My name is Rebecca Stringer. I'm graduating from the BA in Design for Art Direction, and this is my final major project. Made in collaboration with Alex Goodall, Sound Design with Creative Computing, and Chiara Riazzo, Design for Art Direction. How it started. What do you do to relax? What do you do to switch off? 
I, I, well, I like to paint. Um, oh, I make things. I like to. What do you make? I make. I get. I get. I. Well, I like to. Uh, I. Well, I like to. Uh, I. Uh, well, I like to. I. I like to. What do you make? Um, make? I make. Telecation is a telecommunications project, unmapped, unplanned, and without destination, finding itself in the conversations between three students questioning, what do we desire from education? Meanwhile... Talking on the phone, getting out of hand. My love. Rule the bill has many elements of it which are quite authoritarian. They defer to senior police officers on judgments as to whether something can be considered uh, criminal, and that particularly sits in the part of the bill which deals with protest. The system will automatically terminate that too. If protests are considered to be causing serious annoyance, in sorrow and in anger, or disruptive, it remain peaceful, or causing a disturbance. Foolish thing to think I'm protecting my life by staying at home and not taking this chance to come out and speak out. It can be up to senior police officers to decide that that protest is then not allowed to continue. All features built in to minimise the chances of anybody wasting our valuable airwaves. A new model for an old model, Sepika and Giama, curation and education spaces for unlearning. How do we unlearn transactional forms of knowledge and instead think about tools for our own self-education? Against education for simple extraction. How to shift power structure and to create the tools to rethink the world around us. So the concept of other things happening simultaneously is really how we should engage with our learning. Thank you for your help. Apologise for interrupting you. Over and out. <clears throat> how does it work? So you call the number and you're presented with three options. Option one to leave your voicemail. Option two. To hear more about the telecation line. Option three. To listen to Fingers and Ears by Alex Goodall. What happens to your voicemail? By leaving a voicemail, you agree to its redistribution under the Creative Commons. And at this first stage, all we do is we compile all these voicemails and we upload them to this, the Utterance Archive. Once all the voicemail boxes are full, we send out an invitation to all the callers that contribute it, and they can choose to listen on the website simultaneously or one at a time or you can click this little button and you can download and use them for whatever you want why give away your voicemail under the creative Commons? the international copyright system in its current form has enshrined a set of individual and divisible principles that could have been otherwise and that can be adjusted. It is a set of principles that arose out of chance and path dependency and that was established under colonialism, cultural imperialism and conditions of economic and political inequality among interest groups and states. We want to do more than just make things. We want telecation to be a tool to rethink the world around us. Acting as a parasite inside an old model built on hierarchy, we learn from their extraction mode of knowledge production in its collection and archiving but unlearn its transactional value by reimbursing the creative commons what's next we want to open up this space further and make sure that we engage with a self-reflective practice we plan to hold open calls for our, our contributors to rework the contents of the archive create new soundscapes conversations noise or mini lectures this work will then be resituated back into the telecation line for new callers to call up and experience final thought to just nurture the uncommon premises of coming together and the possibilities of being and becoming annoyance, disruptive, and disturbance. And I think that's it, is that it? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, bye. Thanks everyone. It's a hugely impressive collection of projects and no, no doubt super hard to pick a winner out of that group. But now I'll hand back to Graham to let us know what the judges thought. Okay, well, uh, thank you everybody. Um, I'll just start by saying you can see what a tough time the judges had. Uh, uh, all of the presentations were fantastic. Uh, last year, in, last week in our EVA conference, we had people who did, certainly didn't, didn't uh, present as professionally as some of you guys and girls have today. 
So very impressive that you can actually articulate your projects in such a manner as well. I am just going to say before I announce the winner, I'm delighted to have Joe Cannings here, who's Peter's partner. Uh, and Joe and I would just like to really thank the University of the Arts London and Nikki Ryan and Natalie Brett in particular for their continual support for the Peter Cannings Memorial Award. Uh, it's lovely to have this opportunity to see what you folks are doing and that uh, we can have winners and, um, and the people who are runners up, please get in touch with me because we will love to do some nice things with all of you. We're very impressed with what you do. Enough of it, here we go. Okay, I, I will announce the winner of the 2021 Peter Cannings Memorial Award is Christine Zhang for Lost and Found. Well done. Thank you so much. I'm actually so shocked. I thought <laughs> everyone did such an amazing job. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's Christine, yeah. if I may, and if everyone mm. doesn't mind, mm. this is what Carla Rappaport, who is the founder of the Lumen Prize, had to say mm. about your work. Christine Zhang has presented the re-imaging of monuments beautifully and with sensitive, realistic stories representing a wide range of personal histories. Her entry is rich with context and beautifully executed. It shows maturity and depth well beyond her years. Well, there. Thank you. Wow. I'm, I'm actually still shocked. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to say. Like, I, I'm like, yeah, I'm very grateful and I'm so grateful to the people who I worked with who actually were the core of this project. The six participants who like gave me the like personal stories of what makes this project so beautiful. And if anyone, I wanna continue this project further on. So if anyone wants to join and tell me their stories and share their stories, please like get into contact with me as well because this is, going to be a project that exists throughout my whole life I think and we'll just grow with every story that I tell every story that we share and grow with so thank you so much I don't know what else to say um yeah just thanks <laughs> absolutely brilliant I, I've left the panelists my email in chat just to yeah. make things speed up a little bit um and uh, hope to see you all collaborate with each other come up with brilliant ideas for Eva London and um see you again soon I would hope to say rather than uh, this is farewell and off we go into the sunset brilliant congratulations Christine and well done to everyone who was shortlisted I know that must have been a really difficult choice um, I would like to just wrap up also by saying a few thank yous. Um, first and foremost, to all the students who entered the award. Um, it's absolutely an incredible collection of projects, not just the ones that were shortlisted, but all of the students who entered. Um, thanks to all of the design school course leaders who I had to, uh, I kind of irritatingly nagged at very busy times to, to pass on the details to the students. I really appreciate that. Um, thanks to our judging panel, Nick, Carla and Afra. And thanks also to Graham and Joe, uh, without who this award would not be possible. And last but not least, I'd like to echo Graham's sentiment. Thanks to Nikki Ryan and Natalie Brett for supporting the award. Um, and thanks everybody, all the attendees for, for being with us for this. Um, the Peter Cannings Memorial Award was part of UAL Graduate Showcase 2021. Feel free to browse the student work after the event by visiting graduateshowcase.arts.ac.uk. Goodbye, everybody, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day.